evening. My name is Judith Rose, and I'm the Deputy Control Counselor of the French Embassy in the US and Deputy Director of Villa Latin, France's new control institution, reinventing artists' residences and creating a network for arts and ideas spanning France and the United States. We are very happy to welcome you here this evening as we come together to celebrate the publication of Bedna Viper Tess, Seven Plays, the first collection of his major plays translated in American English. <laughs> Bernard Marie Cortez, one of the most emblematic French playwrights of the 20th century, is sadly no longer with us, but his poetry and lyricism continue to be a source of inspiration for audiences around the world. We're always happy to celebrate translation of the works of contemporary French playwrights particularly when these translations are being published. So I would like to thank the Seagull Center team, including Frank Henschker, its director, Amin Erfani, the translator and editor, the actors here, and all the members of the incredible team who kept Caltes' voice alive here in the US and who remained so dedicated to this project. I would also like to thank our team in the Arts Department, as well as our partner, Face Foundation, for their continuing support in bringing Gautis' work to the United States. Thank you all for being with us, and I wish you an excellent evening. I'll now turn the floor to Frank for the introduction of the publication. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Judith, for this beautiful introduction, and thank you to Villa Albertine and the French Cultural Services for being the host of this uh, beautiful space. That's all in a sunny day. It is a nice and beautiful day for us. It is actually the first live event we do since two years. So, thank you all for coming, and we would really like to see you. Cultural services who have been such a fantastic, long standing partner um, going back over decades, and their work here in New York City, I think, is a, an example um, of uh, how cultural exchange, also called cultural diplomacy, but I do think this truly really is a cultural exchange that teaches us that art is important, that it has a place, that it reflects us, it shows who we are, how we have to be seen, but it's also um, something that makes us think who we are and our lives, our families, our relations in our cities, in our countries, but also in the world. And as we know, with the state of Ukraine, um, someone said the opposite of war is not freedom, it's actually creativity. And what we do tonight, I think, is part of this. And I would like to thank the French Health Services for being such a great uh, uh, institution here in New York City. We work with 20 plus uh, organizations in our uh, work in the state, but it's extraordinary. I think what uh, France does and uh, how they support uh, the work of artists and how high the significance is they post on it and then they also go forward in a progressive way of justice or peace and of Um I would like to thank uh, my colleagues Nicole and Laurent who have uh, worked so wonderful this week. You know, Laurent is going soon in August and we're going to uh, uh, miss him, but also Nicole, is it true for you? It's your first event in. In two years, do you want to say a word? Uh, uh, you know, come on, say something. Yeah, you know. She is always, like, I've been working for such a long time uh, in New York City, Nicole is an extraordinary cultural worker. She's not as regular as you really should be. Please come and say a few words. And say, well, how does it feel? Yeah. You know, performing arts has been pretty affected by the uh, pandemic, so just um, thank you very much. I'm very happy that you're here to um, to keep um, Cortez's voice alive in the United States. So thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, uh, it's a truly extraordinary work, all she does, and we often in soccer terms. What happens in the midfield, the little tiny things when you lose the ball or not, 
that's going to go, you get one, and you link one, you lose one. It's little invisible things, the details, and I think what uh, we call it go on, everybody here is also looking for excellence, and we really highly respect it. I would like to thank our co-hosts tonight. We are live streamed nationally, and often we have viewers over 10, 20 countries. I know we have international viewers on HowlRound.com. It's a non-profit U.S. Uh, national streaming service for theater, non-profit theater, hosted Thompson College, fantastic uh, institution. I encourage you all to uh, look at uh, their work. I would like also to thank uh, Chris Silsby, who's with us here. He did the design for the book. Uh, I hope you will get it. It's thirty-five dollars, and tonight we got it for twenty dollars. It costs it cost us actually the money to print it, but I said tonight you are real contestants who came here, put your life at risk. And uh, you should be rewarded uh, with I'm serious, yes, it is true. So um, thank you, um, um, thank you all. Now we are going to come uh, to the evening um, uh, itself. I would like to ask my colleague, and I hope I can also say my friend, I mean, I'm finally my colleague at CUNY, at the great Lehman College, and we have colleagues here from the Lehman College also with us, which shows this is a functioning institution because in some university people never go if their colleagues do something. You know? And uh, so, I mean, <coughs> why don't you tell us a little bit about Coltex? Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming and the courage to come here today, indeed. Um, I first, before I speak about the book, I need to give you time, thanks to a number of people and make a number of enemies because I don't have time to thank everybody. First of all, uh, I want to thank Francois Cortez, the brother of Bernard Moy, uh, whose friendship and trust really made this book happen. This book has been for many, many, many years into the making. And, uh, we will get into this. We'll get into this. Um, thank you also, Frank, of course, Frank Hensher, uh, who is the director of the Martin Siegel Theater and, and the head of the Siegel Publications. I could not think of a better publication, publishing house, uh, than Frank's because he totally understands and grasps the stake of this book. Thank you, of course, Viva uh, Bertin and the French Cultural Services for your hospitality. Um, thank you, Marion, uh, for all the work you've done. Marion uh, started a Cortez Festival almost 20 years ago, 2003. Yes. And three of the translations in this book, early versions of them, were from that festival. Um, I do want to thank one other person who is not here with us. Is a very close friend of mine, and uh, Ismail Connor. Ismail, if you're watching us, you should be here. A very uh, extremely talented actor who encountered Cortes in 2003, also, I believe, in 2006, did another festival in Atlanta that lasted six years, and we owe him a lot too. Although his translation on that in this book, his talent made it happen. Um, I want to, of course, name the translators, right? Uh, Marion Chauvard, Adam Miller, Teresa Lugard, uh, Andy Bragan, couldn't be here, uh, unfortunately, today, Mikael Atias, who is a jazz musician, is in Berlin, jazzing up right now, <laughs> so he won't be able to be here. So, this collection, as I said, uh, really is a collaborative work, and it's a work of love. When I say this, I really mean it. People who work on Cortez, who read him, who stage him, who write on him, who study him, they truly develop a love relationship with him. And that's for that very reason the community of Cortez, the Cortez community is big and getting stronger every day. I know that some people are watching from France this stuff. Um, <laughs> Um, so, yes, but this has been translated in 30, over 30 languages, staged all over the world. One of the, one of the playwrights who have been most staged outside of France. And we are making the point of making this book to give it new momentum for the English speaking world. And this is, the, this is not the first translation of Cortes, 
uh, in English, this is the, what we could say a second attempt. Uh, we can take into, uh, we, we will talk about why, why we thought that this book was necessary to give it really a second attempt. Um, what I try to do as an editor here is to provide English speaking um, leadership artists Context is a very long introduction to the book. There's a quite substantive biographical account of this at the end of the book. And I try to really give access to all the material in French that are not accessible if you don't speak French. So I hope that this really gives a new force for protest studies, for the production of protests, for the new protest readership in the US. It's a definitive anthology, at least for the next 20 years. I think translation should be like every generation new, but this uh, is a treasure mine, I think. It has been reworked on and also to be translated. The big ones, the big place, and for everybody, everybody knows what we call Tesla, but if not, it would be as a Tony Kushner, you know, mm -hmm. would have uh, his evening in Paris, and he would say he's actually an important uh, playwright in the US. So, um, but now we come uh, to our evening. We're going to present you seven excerpts, but don't be scared of short ones. Uh, we were wrestling. Should we do one full one? Should we create a little tiny festival? But we didn't know how for one after one. So we thought, why not have, uh, uh, in the sense of Rauschenberg, the great idea of the American idea of the collage, why don't we collage um, excerpts and see how they listen to each other? They all talk to each other. And we have a fantastic group among actors with us. Amin also put this together as the director. Um, we have uh, one uh, uh, actor missing, the great Carl Hancock Brooks. I don't know if anyone knows him. He's going to be actually the, the Carl of the Venice Biennial. He's a Lincoln Center Justice this morning. Very mean. Uh, he did a, a, a works, but he seems he had corona. Okay. So he's at home at 4 o'clock. Um, he said, I'm terribly sorry, but I cannot come. But uh, believe it or not, I'm me next to me. The translator of editor I said, okay, I'll get also. Uh, uh, say he knows the words, they are treasured words, they are sacred words, and we did not uh, want to give them away to someone like me or someone else. Who so <laughs> really, really knows that. So we're going to have those uh, excerpts that I mean, I will talk a little bit, and then going to ask the translators to come with us and have an open uh, conversation. Again, we really would like to thank you, the audience. It's what has been missing so much in our work, and uh, that you take the time to come and listen to what most probably you already know about to come to celebrate a book. But it's been, I think it was Jackie Kennedy who said, if you did one book in your life, your life already is meaningful. So, uh, so, like, so we celebrate this, we celebrate books in a time where it's complicated. You know, there's the French Revolution that he created also a bookstore. We have a high respect for that. So, so um, this means uh, really a lot to us um, this evening, besides the fact that it hopefully signals the beginning of post-corona or the time after um, corona. We're going to start um, with the night uh, just uh, before um, the forest. But let me take a tell you some quotes. Um, I'm going to put some together for me. So, Cortez Kennedy, the Oscars, Julius Tolesky, Boston Young. Cortez said about theater a lot. And he said, uh, I like my job as a writer because it is inessential. Making theater is the most superficial, useless thing in the world. And as a result, I want to do it in perfection. He said, you develop an astonishing relation with language in a foreign country. I write differently, for instance, in New York than in Paris. I had a very strong relation to New York City, and we will talk about this later. He said, you take a particular pleasure because you are the home. A word itself has no meaning. For meaning to appear, there needs to be an accumulation of words, a rhythm, and music. Music produces meaning. An isolated word does not. So now we come to the night before the force and Amin put uh, together beautiful descriptions, which he was supposed to read before the evening, and they have one of our performers. So that we want to give a little context. The night just because before the forest is a one-sentence monologue, and it made him famous overnight. 
of over 10,000 words. So one sentence was 10,000 words, with no period at the end, written in a very rhythmical and musical way. Cortes compared it to a few by Johann Sebastian Bach. Written in 77, Cortes considers it the beginning of his true dramatic body of work. Of the play here, a homeless man approaches you at a street corner, half drunk. He asks you for a light, for a cigarette, for money to buy a coffee or a beer, for a room to sleep at night, and most and most, most foremost, for love. And uh, we have Amin with us who will read the words. I ran after you the moment I saw you turn the street corner. Despite all the pricks left in the streets, in the cafes, in the basement of the cafes, here, everywhere, despite the rain and the wet clothes, I ran, not only for the room, not only for the part of the night for, the, for which I knew the room, but I ran, 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 so that this time, turning the corner, I, must, I don't find myself in the street empty of you, so that this time I don't find only the rain, the rain, the rain, so that this time I find you on the other side of the corner, and I dare shout, brother, I dare grab you by the arm, brother, I dare approach you, brother, it was... I can't approach you, brother. I don't grab you by the arm. Uh, give me a light. That'll cost you nothing, brother. This nasty rain, this nasty wind, this fucking intersection. There's nothing good in, in walking around here tonight for you or for me. But I don't have any cigarettes. It wasn't really for a smoke. And then I said, Give me a light, brother. It was, brother, to tell you. This fucking neighborhood, this fucking habit of walking around here, way to approach people, and you, you walk around, your clothes soaking wet, taking the risk to catch any possible disease. I'm not asking you for a cigarette either, brother. I don't even smoke. It will, it will cost you nothing. No lights, no cigarettes, brother, no money. Then you walk away, 20 bucks, don't make a difference for me. Not tonight. And besides, I've got enough to buy to buy us coffee. Let me treat, brother, instead of walking around in the streets lights. So it costs you nothing that I've approached you. Maybe I have my way of approaching people. But in the end, it costs them nothing. I'm not talking about a room, brother, a room to spend the night, because then the nicest guys have their mouths shut. You'd walk away. Let's not talk about a room then, brother. But I have an idea to tell you. Come, let's not stay here. We'll catch something. We're sure. No money, no job. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make things easy for me. I'm not really looking for one. I'm not looking for a job. It's not really that. It's that I have this idea first that I must tell you. You and me walking around here in the street, in the city, with no money in our pockets. Well, I'll buy you coffee, brother. I have enough. I'm not taking that back. Not now. Because on the first impression, it's not the money. It's not you or me that keeps us nailed to the ground. So me, I've got this idea. It's for our defense. Only for our defense because that is really what we need to defend ourselves, right? Maybe you think, not me, but then, let me tell you, maybe I'm the one who approached you. I'm the one who needs a room tonight. No, brother, I didn't say I did. I'm the one who asked, brother, give me a light. But the one who approaches is not always the weak one. And I saw right away, from there, that you didn't look very strong, walking around all wet, not very tough at all, while me, 
Despite all this, I'm resourceful and mean. I recognize those who aren't very strong. It is true that today the blood of our people is black and Arab. There's new blood because of the presence of black and Arabs. There's new blood in the heartland of France, which is a desert. There, no life exists. And if anything happens, it is always thanks to immigrants. Come to the second reading, the battle of blacks and dogs. In 1978, Coltex was invited to join a friend to Lagos, Nigeria, to a French construction camp. During his stay, one of the blight engineers kills a black construction worker, it's a real event, and throws his body in the sewers. The worker's name was Mofia. A poll, Coltex writes a play here called Battle of Blacks and Dogs in which the character, Algobi, walks into a French construction camp to reclaim the body of his murdered brother. Horn, the head of the camp, cannot find the body and tries to offer money instead. As a businessman, Horn does not understand why Abu will not accept money and why he will not forget about his brother. And we can have Michael Wiener as Horn and Crystal. Uh, will, uh, will read for us, and um, all name is Crystal, Maria, and Crystal Maria Stewart. <laughs> but why are you being so stubborn for such a little thing? I told you I'd give you compensation. Often what little people want is a very simple little thing. But this little thing, they want it. Nothing will change their minds. They willingly die for it. Even if you killed them, even dead, they'd still want it. Who was he, and who are you? A long time ago, I say to my brother, I can feel the cold. He says, that's because there's a little cleft between the sun and you. I say, how can this little cloud make me freeze when all around me people are sweating and burning in the sun? My brother says, I'm freezing too. So we warmed each other up. Afterwards, I say to my brother, but when will this cloud disappear? When will the sun warm us too? He says, it won't ever disappear. This little cloud is following us everywhere we go. It will always be there between the sun and us. And wherever we went, I could feel it following us, with people all around, naked and laughing in the heat. My brother and I, together we froze and gave each other warmth. And so, under this cloud that took the heat away from us, my brother and I warmed each other up. And we got accustomed to each other. With my back itch, I had my brother scratch it. And I scratched his whenever his back itch. Worry made me bite the nails on his head. And he'd suck the thumb on my hand in his sleep. The women we took clung to us. Soon they were freezing too. We were all so close and tight under the cloud that we kept each other warm. We got so accustomed to each other, one man shivered would ripple across from one end of the roof to the other. Mothers joined us and Mothers, mothers, and their children, and our children, a multitudinous family from which not even the dead could be torn away. That's how close and tight we kept them 
under the cloud that took the heat away from us. The little cloud had risen, risen towards the sun, taking the heat away from a family that was getting larger and more accustomed to each other all the time. A multitudinous family made up of bodies, either dead, alive, or soon to be alive, each one more necessary to the other as we watched the borders of the earth, still warmed by the sun, get further away. That's why I'm here, asking for my brother's body that was torn away from us, because his being gone breaks the closeness that keep, kept us warm. Because even dead, we need his feet to keep us warm, and he needs our feet to preserve his. We're having difficulties understanding each other, so. <laughs> I think, however hard we try, living side by side will always be difficult. They tell me in America, blacks go out in the morning, and whites in the afternoon. Is that what they tell you? and dogs translated by Michael Matthias. Now we come uh, to the next reading, West Pierce. Cortez lived and loved New York and lived here, and he wrote, I didn't have the time to dream about Paris. I immediately dreamed and dreamt about New York. In New York in 68, it was really a different world. It was truly like no other city in the world. It was like a big bag where you put everything that could not fit anywhere else. About the play West Pier, Cortez falls in love with New York City at the age of 20 and compulsively returns to the city throughout his life and spends a great amount of time in the abandoned West End Piers of Manhattan by the Hudson River where the gay community thrived until the end of the 70s and early 80s. But the mayor of New York, Ed Koch, cleans up the city in the early 80s, closing bathhouses and destroying the abandoned West Pierce Hall House for the gay community. To take revenge, Cortez writes West Pier in 83. In it, the mayor features as a character who is a bankrupt tycoon who is driven by a secretary to an abandoned warehouse by the river, inhabited by a community of homeless migrants who, by the end of the play, take revenge on Koch. At the start of the play, Louise Koch is returning to the place of his childhood, at the abandoned piers where he grew up in a lower class household to commit suicide. Monique, his secretary, does not know the reason why Monique's forced her to try to this decrepit warehouse. West Pier, translated by Mario Chabat, Teresa, Libra, that was here, with uh, Jose Scaro, Josefina Scaro as Monique. What about me? What should I do? I can't leave you alone here. And I can't leave without you because I'm the one who knows how to drive. I'm the one responsible for bringing you here. And you can do anything by yourself with your freaking boat. And I don't even exist anymore. Really? You look like a fool. You could at least leave the street lights on. We could see something. There's something slippery on the ground, and I don't know what it is. You know, in my family, I was notorious for my ability to see clearly in the dark. They even quit locking in the they even quit locking in the basement to frighten me. But I never seen this much darkness before. I should never have left the keys in the car. That would be the icing on the cake. If someone steals it, Christ! It would take hours to get out of this place on foot with no signs or street lights. Besides, 
Maurice, I think someone is watching us. I'm sure of it. There used to be streetlights here. It was a normal, vibrant, middle-class neighborhood, middle neighborhood. I remember it very well. There were parks with trees. There were cars, cafes and shops. There were old people crossing the streets, children and strollers. The old warehouses were used as parking lots and, and flea markets. It was a neighborhood for artists and retired people, an ordinary and innocent world. It wasn't that long ago. But today, Christ, it doesn't matter who, the most innocent person who gets lost here in the middle of the afternoon could be slaughtered in broad daylight and their body thrown into the river without anyone even thinking to look for them here. And why? Because rents are too low. They should have encouraged the landlords to raise their rents. They should have been forced to raise them, even if they didn't want to. The roaches, the rats, and the roaches have infiltrated this place like conquering soldiers. The walls, the lungs have left the walls cracked. The broken windows haven't been replaced. The old people died. So finally the merchants were forced to flee the neighborhood. And today, all these buildings, miles of street lined with buildings, are worth a cent. Not a nickel to anyone. Nothing at all. Nothing. It's disgusting. God knows what things here now. God knows what's watching us. Let's go, Marie. You, you aren't saying any word. You aren't saying a word anyway. And I don't intend to talk to myself all evening. Let's go. The engine is running. Don't go over there, Maurice. The ground is slippery, and you are not wearing proper dress shoes. Maurice, Maurice, this world is not for the living. Where are you? I can't see anything. I can't hear anything. The engine. I can't hear the car anymore. Don't leave me alone. Don't leave me alone. Maurice? I have seen things so beautiful, so beautiful in Harlem, on the west side of the Hudson River, on the nights of New York. If I had enough talent to steal a piece of this beauty, I know I would be the most accomplished writer in the world in this century. It is a privileged corner of the world, these warehouses of the West End. Like a mysterious neglected square in the middle of a garden where the plants would have grown differently. A place where normal order doesn't exist, but where a different order, a curious one, is created. Now we come to the solitude of cotton fields. It is this playwright second kind of New York play in the abandoned west fields of Manhattan, called Test but Business a Scene between Two Men in which one attempts to sell something to another. But it soon becomes clear to Cortez that the seller has no merchandise and is instead begging for money. And in a truly unique and unparalleled language, Cortez staged a dialogue between a man being accosted by another in the street during twilight. The dealer attempts to sell something to the client, but stubbornly refuses to reveal his merchandise. Is it drugs, sex, or other goods? The client, feeling threatened, denies having any illicit desire, yet remains perplexed by what the dealer might have to offer. By the end of the play, nothing has been bought, nothing has been sold. We have witnessed a poetic battle of words between those two characters, a unique relationship. And we have now with us, 
Michael Wiener is the client in Crystal Marie Store Estate. At the very least, if it were true that you, the salesman, or merchandise so mysterious that you refuse to show them to me, or let me guess what they are, and that I, the buyer, have a desire so secret that I'm not aware of it, and that in order for me to see that I have one, I would need to scratch my memory like a scab and make it bleed. If that is true, then why do you keep your merchandise to yourself? Now that I have stopped? Now that I'm here? Now that I'm waiting? It's, it's like those doormen at the, the striptease clocks who catch you by the elbow when you go home at night and whisper in your ear. She's here tonight. But if you showed them to me, if you gave a name to your offer, listed or listed goods, but named and therefore submitted to judgment at the very least, if you named them for me, I would be able to say no and would stop feeling like a shaken tree, rattled to its roots by an unpredictable wind. Because I know how to say no. And I like saying no. I am able to blow you away with my nose, to make you discover all the ways there are to say no, which begin with all the ways there are to say yes. Like the coquettes trying on all the dresses and the shoes, only to buy nothing at the end. And the pleasure they find in trying them on only comes from the pleasure they find in refusing them all. Make up your mind. Show yourself. Are you the brute stumping on the pavement? Or are you a businessman? If so, lay out your merchandise first, and then we'll take the time to look them over. It is because I want to be a businessman and no brute but a real businessman that I will tell you what I possess or offer, because I cannot suffer a refusal, which is the one thing in the world a businessman dreads most, since it is a weapon he does not possess himself. But the more a salesman is decent, the more the buyer is deviant. All a salesman wants is to satisfy a desire he doesn't already know while the buyer always trades his desire for the primary satisfaction of refusing what is offered to him. His unspoken desire is elated by the primary satisfaction of refusing what is offered to him. His unspoken desire is elated by the refusal and he gives up on his desire for the pleasure of humiliating the salesman. But I am not the kind of businessman who shows the price tag to satisfy his client's inclination for anger and indignation. I am not here to give pleasure. Instead, I am here to fill the void of desire, to recall desire and force it to have a name. Drag it on the ground and give it shape and weight, along with the necessary cruelty involved in giving shape and weight to desire. Because I see yours like saliva spilling at the corner of your lips before you swallow it back in, and I'll wait for it to spill over your chin or wait for you to spit. And only then I will hand you a tissue to wipe yourself clean, because if I hand it to you, I know you would refuse it for me. And this is the sort of refusal I cannot bear to suffer. Um, this was translated by Armin Frank. Um, 
Children's Commission. Bob Cunfield is one of the great books of theater in the history of theater. I find it essential to travel after your studies. When you travel, you learn things that will remain useful your whole life. If you don't shout that in the face of an 18-year-old kid and the small space they occupy the world, they will spend their lives thinking they're so very important and that their careers are so very important. If you learn this when you travel, when you're young, you won't forget your lesson. For me, when I was 20, it called everything into question. Now we come to uh, Tava Tava. In the same poetic style as the solitude of cotton fields that we just wrote, Tava Tava is a very short play written in 1986. Stages two siblings and a Harley Davidson. We couldn't get it up the stairs. We would yeah. try to, uh, <laughs> so, but we got the motor of the Harley Davidson out. Instead of going out in the streets of Taba Taba, the brother Abu secludes himself in his backyard, referring to Phil, the beat up Harvey Davis. His sister, Mayamuna, scolds him for projecting a very bad image on her by defying social expectations. This is again translated by Amina Fari, and we have Marie Crystal Stewart as Marie. My Muna and uh, we have Ami as Lila. Why don't you go out at night when all the boys your age are already out in the streets wearing shirts, the crease of their pants ironed out, prowling around the girls? All Tabata is out. All Tabatana is crimped up. The boys flirt with the girls, and the girls spent all day doing their hair. And my brother has got grease all over his paws, and he's filling with his machine. Shame on me. People are going to think I don't know how to iron a shirt. In the morning, instead of taking apart the machine's engine to put it back together in the evening, if you gave me your shirt to wash, your jacket to iron, the button of your pants to sew back on, I would not be humiliated in the evening when the other boys come and ask, where's he, little Abu? Where's he, your brother? Where's our pal? We want to go out with him. Shame on me. He's right here in the courtyard with the dogs and the old ladies and the chickens with a nasty old rag in his hands. Wash up your mop or I'll slap you. Make dreadlocks. Braid your hair, shave your skull, give me your shirt. Stop being my shame. In the evening, when the women next door come, with their stuck up faces, Fatumata especially, and I ask, Your brother? Where's he then? Our darling. Where's he? Little Abu. What can I tell them? He's in engine oil. <laughs> he smells like an old machine. There's buttons missing on his pants. Shame on me! Let go of this old rag! Pull your head out of the machine's butt. <laughs> Do you think a girl would want to ride on this after spending all afternoon doing her hair? You don't even use it to get out. You only use it to stay in. How do you think that makes me look? My brother, a filthy brother among the old ladies, bent over his machine at the hour when everybody was out. How do you think that makes me look? At this hour of the evening and in this heat, when you should be drinking beer in the juke joints, when you should be out prowling out those Tuck up women next door. You're the disgrace of 
I don't want to walk in the streets of Tel Aviv. They're full of dog shit. I don't want to drink beer at the juke joints. They're not even cold and they're too late. I don't like the woman next door. They make, they smell like chicken. And I don't like the way they do their hair and the way they dress. I prefer them in the morning when they prepare the meal. And as soon as night comes, I don't like my pals anymore. I like my bike and my paws full of grease and this filthy rag. I prefer my pants without buttons on them and my shirts wrinkled up. I like the old cold courtyards and the old people and the goats. A goat smells like a goat. I don't want to smell like chicken. I don't want to smell like meat. I want to choose my filth and stay in my courtyard. Leave my pals alone and forget about the woman next door. Don't stay here. I don't need you. Go away, my Nuna. When it gets hot like this, it makes me want to kill. quietly contained in the body and there's no additional meaning or color or value in the stomach or the spinal cord but instead the blood that is drying on the sidewalks. We now come to back to the desert <coughs> written in 1987 and it takes place in the provincial town east of France reminiscent of Metz where Cortes was born this kind of desert we first to the Arab cafes actually were blown up by right-wing French activists in the 60s under the supervision of the town's governor, the general Jacques Massou. It's called Togedens again. At the beginning of the Vene Matilde, exiled to Algeria by a wealthy family during the war, returns to the town with two mixed blood children to reclaim her part of the heritage from Adrian, her brother. Translated by Andy Braden, and we have Ben Becher as Adrian and Josefina Starro as Matilda. <coughs> Matilda! <laughs> My uh, dear sister, you come back to our good uh, little town. And you come with good intention. Now that age has Mellowed us a little bit, we should try to avoid quarreling during your very short visit. <laughs> during the 15 years you've been gone, I've grown accustomed and used to not quarreling. It'd be hard to start up again. Huh? Adrian, my brother, <laughs> my intentions are good. And if age has mellow you, I'm happy to hear it. Life will be easier during my very long stay. <laughs> In my case, age, instead of meddling with me, has put me on edge. I'm between your calm and my nerves. Everything should be fine. Well, you wanted to escape the war, so naturally you came back to your roots, to your child. Put home, and you did the right thing. Soon the war will be over. Soon you'll return to Algeria, the sunny Algeria. You'll have borne these uncertain times which affect us all here in this home. 
my roots, what roots? I'm not a tree, I have feet, and they are meant for the soil. And as for the word, my dear Adrian, I couldn't give a damn. I'm not here to escape the war. On the contrary, I brought it with me to this good little town where I have some old scores to settle. And if it's taken me so long to come back and settle this course, it is because too much misfortune has softened my resolve. But 15 years without hardship has brought back the memories and the rancor and the faces of my enemies. Enemies? Enemies, my dear sister? You? <laughs> you, in this good little town, distance has fed your imagination, which has never lacked. Loneliness and Algeria's hot sun have fried your brain. But if I, I believe you would simply come back to look over your inheritance and then leave. <laughs> Go ahead, look around. See how well I've taken care of things. Admire how I've improved the place. Once you've had a good look, touch everything, we'll prepare for your departure. But I didn't come here to leave, Adrian. I've come with baggage and children. Yeah. And I've come back to this house because I own it. Improved or destroyed, I will always own it. I want to settle down in the place I own. You own. You own. My dear Matilda, you own. Wonderful, wonderful. I've paid you rent. I've improved its value considerably. But so you own. Very well. But don't start upsetting me. Don't start in with your tricks. Come on, why don't you make an effort? Let's let's start over with our hellos. We, we've gotten off to the wrong foot. Then let's start over, my dear Adrian. Let's start. Oh. <laughs> now we come to our uh, last uh, reading. Famous for Bertie Zucker. Contest for this man who had Zucker killed for no reason. It's a play for the serial killer. This is why, for me, he is a hero. He completely matches the man of our century. And the way he commits his murder brings us back to the great mythologies. The admiration, the gaze of all the others towards him, because he was such a hideous temptation. The gaze, the admiration, that's what turned him into a hero. There are no heroes whose clothes are soaked in blood, and blood's the only thing in the world that cannot go unnoticed. What the play, in 1988, an Italian man, Roberto Zucco, murders his father, his mother, a police officer, and other civilians. Italy, Switzerland, and France issue warrants for his arrest. The wanted person posters can be seen all over Paris metro stations. The media and the public become obsessed by this young, handsome murderer. In his last completed play, entitled Roberto Zucco, Cortez stages the rise and fall of this mediatized assassin. In the following scene, Zucco hides from the police. At the night in the Paris metro station, they sink his poster, it's just in there. An old man who is lost on his way and was not able to exit the station before it closes down, finds Zucco sitting on a bench. Zucco does not reveal his identity, passes himself or someone else, and by the end of the scene, helps the old man out of the subway station. Translated by um, Anna Miller, and Ben Beppo as Roberto Zucco, and Michael Wiener as the old man. I'm an old man, and I've let myself stay out there than reasonable. I was so glad to have caught the last train, when suddenly, at an intersection, this maze of corridors and escalators, 
I couldn't recognize my stuff, which I used so regularly, I thought I knew it as well as my kitchen. But I didn't know it hid behind the straightforward route I use every day, a dark world of tunnels, of unknown directions that I would have preferred not to know. But my stupid gas of mindless forced me to know. And then suddenly the lights turn off and leave all these little white side lights whose, whose very existence escaped me. So I walk straight ahead in an unknown world, fast as possible, which doesn't mean a lot for an old man like me. And when at the end of the station's es endless escalators, I think I see an exit. Bam! Giant wire gate locks access to it. So here I am, in, in quite a curious situation for a man of my age. Punished by my absent-mindedness and the slowness of my gait, waiting for I don't know what, and I, I don't really want to know what, because such novelties are truly difficult to swallow at my age. But you, young man, whose legs seem very agile to me, and whose mind seems very clear, yes. I can see your clear gaze. It's, it's neither blurred nor foolish, like, a, like that of an old man like me. It's, it, it's impossible to believe that you let yourself get tricked by these, these corridors and these closed wire gates. No, even a closed gate. A young man with a clear mind like you could get through it like a drop of water through a colander. You work nights here. Tell me about yourself. That'll reassure me. Oh. I'm a normal, reasonable young man, <laughs> mister. <laughs> well, I've never stood out, but would I have stood out to you if I hadn't been sitting next to you? But I've always thought the best way to live peacefully was to be as, as transparent as a pane of glass like a chameleon on a, on a stone to go through walls that have neither color nor scent so that people's gaze go, go, go through you. And, 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 and it sees the people behind you as if you weren't there. It's a tough job being transparent. It's a profession. It's an old, very old dream to be invisible. Well, I'm no hero. Heroes are criminals. <laughs> there are no heroes whose clothes are soaked in blood. And blood's the only thing in the world that cannot go unnoticed. It's the most visible thing in, in, in the world. When everything's destroyed, and the only, only the thin fog of the end of the world covers the, the ground. There'll always be blood so close. Of the heroes. I was a student. Uh, I was a good student. You, you never go back after being used to being a good student. I, I'm enrolled at the university in the classrooms of the so world. My seat. <laughs> It's reserved with other good students among them who I don't stand out. Nothing good changes the course of things, Mr. I'm like a train that calmly passes a meadow and nothing can make go off the rails. We can always go off the rails, young man. Yes. Now I know, anyone can go off the rails at any time. And all that makes me really scared, young man. 
there, 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 there are uh, things to be scared of. You ran. My best son had a very special relationship in New York, New York. And he came here when he was 20. And from that point on, he came back compulsively. He said that there are urges that he can fulfill here in this city that he cannot fulfill in other cities. If anybody who lived in New York could see that. Um, now, you know, okay, as I mentioned, Cortez has been translated in over 30 languages. He's been, he is still produced all over the world. Um, now the English translations have been lagging, and not translations, the productions. The productions of this in English have been lagging in comparison with the other uh, languages. Um, now, there are, I would say, maybe two reasons for this. There's been, in 2003, uh, Marion here did a very big festival that will come up for us on top. Uh, so it's been 20 years, I mean, some of the translations here started 20 years ago and they've been worked through throughout these years. Um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, there have been British, uh, English, uh, and British English translations that came out. And they did a good service to both this because they introduced both this into the English language. Now, uh, the reason why the productions are lagging today in English may be said on the one hand that Cortes, as we may have heard tonight, has a very specific language that is quite different from what is done here in the US in terms of theater or even in England in terms of theater. Um, British theater, American theater, as you know, are, most, are, are most, mostly cloud based. Uh, the language is mostly naturalistic, not all of them, but the majority. Um, and the characters were psychological. All of these are principles that Cortes wrote against. And um, so Cortes's characters are not psychological, as we could see, for example, with Zuko, they're mostly almost like mythical. Uh, the language is utterly poetic, utterly musical, rhythmical, incantatory, invocatory, um, and the plots are, you know, sometimes not there, as we, as we saw it. And what the heck was the dealer dealing? Nobody knows. Um, but what he does, really, it brings, uh, he brings out confidence, tensions that exist, 
often in society and they are often repressed. He just brings them out and exposes them, but he doesn't resolve them. And they just are there, almost an explosion, and we have to deal with them. Uh, so there is no resolution often to this uh, phase. So there is a, let's say, a traditional difference right, between the American, British, and then the, we would say, French theater. But then again, French theater is not really a good way to explain Cortes because Cortes' style is very unique also in France. Right? And you mentioned in the quotes, and it's important, that he is a typical writer traveler. As in, he, they, these two things go together. And he often says that he writes in countries, in countries whose languages he doesn't understand, so that that obscurity kind of contaminates his writing. Mm -hmm. So his own writing becomes a bit foreign. Tell us a bit, what did you struggle with? What, did, what, what is different in the country with your team? And you, what, tell us some words or sentences. Um, what is the essence you try to catch? Or how did you solve it? Absolutely. Um, in order to answer that question, uh, maybe a transition from your previous question to this one, in saying that this translation, this book that we try to do, we try to do something different from the previous translations that were available in English. The previous translations, um, it's fair to say that they introduced the purpose of the English word, but at the same time they compromised on the language. And uh, the language was rendered more naturalistic. There was slang, but there wasn't any slang in, uh, in French. And for example, it has this kind of magical ability to make something sound provocative or slang-like with the most human French. Uh, with the most poetic French. And, and that's not just in British translation, I and mean, that's a tendency that often comes in translating Cortes. People often jump into slang where in fact there is no slang at all. And what we wanted to do, uh, we worked together uh, to go over line by line all the translations and make sure that we don't add to the text. When we bring about the musicality, the rhythm, Another trick, so this is answering your second question. Another trick that he does that is really, that taught me personally, is um, he repeats certain words, he repeats certain expressions almost impulsively through a play, or he ascribes some sort of repetitions to the character. But those repetitions, those words, may change meaning in a different context. So often translators, as a consequence, choose a completely different word for that different context to be more communicative. But no, for this doesn't. And not, and just through that operation, he creates, again, rhythm. Uh, he creates a certain form of emotion. He transmits emotions through musicality and repetition. And that was really the most important um, aspect that we wanted to preserve in this book. And instead of adapting to British or main American sensibilities, we really try to do our best to present it the world the way it is, as faithful as it is, because we think, I think, I think we think that it really does something unique and it works in itself. We don't need what surprised you along on your work? Um, did you learn? Yeah, I mean, what, what, what I, um, I am describing here was an early kind of revelation for me. And I think that what I learned is, as one of the quotes that you read, for example, who says that there is no meaning in the word, there is meaning in the repetition of words, in the musicality, in the music, for example. And a word in itself has to be. And really, as a translator, but also as, not only as a scholar, because I write on Cortes on this matter, as a translator, but I have to say also, um, I started translating Cortes and nobody knew him. Um, in 2000, the, the letters of Cortes came out in 2009, I believe. And in one of the letters, 
because he translated Shakespeare and he writes that the reason why he started translating was to learn how to write because there was no, uh, like today, there wasn't any school where you could go to know how to learn how to write. And I, I must confess that you know, it was also kind of my approach to translation. But this taught me many things in learning how to write. Next week, we're going to uh, shortly ask our friends uh, to join. We have uh, Marion and Teresa and the others. Someone said the translating is also sometimes like a love affair. You can be faithful to the text or you can betray it. You know? But sometimes, if you're faithful, it's a betrayal. Sometimes a betrayal can be faithful. And um, so it is uh, quite something. So we're going to ask our, our friends, the translators, and we have the Cedo uh, place uh, to be a high and important. Um, there is a window in the chair. Yeah, yes. Okay. And we need one more chair, maybe. Yeah. No, come here. Okay. Bring one more chair. Here. No, 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 it's fine. So translation is of significance, it's important because it's often overlooked. It's a work of creation. And, um, and maybe, yeah, we all can. So tell us a little bit, how was it for you, the translation was? Um, it, it was long. <laughs> <laughs> this is also an over a decade of working on this text, and I just want to thank the actors for great work with it tonight. It's just such a joy to get to hear it speak. Um, I, I fell in love with Colcast the first time I read him in college, and I uh, basically haven't stopped working on him since. Translator as a scholar. And Ami has, uh, in papers and conferences, they talked about the, the strangeness of Coltes's language. Um, that's definitely something that attracted me to him, is um, how he both builds a sort of strangeness in the language, he makes words that, um, that are familiar to us feel somehow different, like we're losing touch with what they mean, and then brings it back in this repetition and this quality. essential poetry. Tell us a bit about your relation to it. Is this on? Yeah. I'm an interloper up here. I, um, I stumbled into this translation through this beautiful woman over here who, um, I did theater together with her in Iowa, where I was in college, and she was there, not in college, and we both ended up in New York in, um, in the 90s, and so I think we were both about 23 years old at that point, and Mario said, I think maybe we saw In the Loveliness of the Cotton Fields together at, at BAM, and she became obsessed with doing a production of Coltes and bringing Coltes to New York. And she said, I, I want to translate this play. You should help me translate this play. <laughs> and I said, sure, what the hell? I'll translate this play with you. I was an English major. I studied French in high school. I do not speak French. I, I was not just an night, and I um, translated Marion very well, I think. <laughs> but we just sat in a, a cafe um, many hours together. And I learned Coltes from this woman. And everything you said, it's very emotional because it was a long time ago. But um, the language, it's so true because she was so determined to keep the language true to the tone and that it wasn't natural. And, and she would try to tell me, this is what he's saying. And I would say, well, tell me in French, is it, is it formal? Is it slang? It, it, what does it seem to you in French? And she would describe it in French in English to me, and then we would decide on the correct English words. I mean, that was literally the process line by line. Yeah, and often uh, it's great uh, to translate in collaboration. We often we encourage it. Often when we have texts, also we often ask a New York playwright to go over it in, at the very very end. Um, just uh, but Mario, why about yes, why, why did you choose him to be such a big part of your life? Well, it's a long affair, <laughs> long, very long affair. Um, I guess I. Because for me, is, I'm a theater director, 
So I approach translation from the director's point of view, because there are many different ways to translate. There are literal ways, there are scholar ways, there are poetic ways, there are many different ways, and every way has to be translated in 10 years because language, culture changes, people <coughs> change. So my approach, uh, I'm a theater director, and that was my love, was I, the, the contest world is more abstract for me and more, uh, um, I would say, uh, how do you say it from the stomach? It's uh, uh, guts, guts, yeah. it's streets, it's dirt, it's sex, it's, uh, and it's all beautiful at the same time, it's very elegant and very eloquent, but at the same time, it really digs into uh, human uh, tribes. So that's what I love about Coltes. And when I, you know, I went to see a film, Patrice Chirot, uh, illustrated the Cotton film, which was absolutely fantastic. That's when I decided I want to live in the city and I want to do Coltes. And that's how it started in 95. Then we did West Fear, and I, trained, I directed three plays of Coltes West Fear, Taba Taba, and Illustrated of Cotton Film. Right? And then in 2003, with many, many um, translators, we started the translations, and um, I have to mention, uh, you know, the Ohio Theater and the Wisconsin School and uh, in parentheses my company, and then we presented these new plays in a, you know, the entire, uh, basically, um, work of Cortez, and then the rights were pulled off, so we did unplug Cortez uh, with you, <laughs> and then Amin came along, and he was uh, strong enough and visionary enough to pull it off. So that was a very uh, wonderful, it's a wonderful thing that happened to the place today. So thank you so much. Many of you did not know Fontes and one says every generation, every 20 years, one has to retranslate it anyway. So uh, I'll meet such so 20 years people will say about this book. Well, what they did in this book, you know, I, you know, it has to be different. But I don't know if any one of you wants to say how how did it feel? Oh, it was really fun. <laughs> um, I was really mad that it's sometimes when you do like experimental or abstract stuff, it can be frustrating because it doesn't feel like it's about anything. But this didn't feel like that. Like you're right, it didn't have. It wasn't like super plotty, but that didn't really matter because I could always tell, at least for me, what the character was trying to get from the other person. And as an actor, that's all I need to know to do the scene. You know what I mean? Whereas it wasn't like one of those like weird plays where it's like, and then there's an egg that falls in the sky. And then you have to make it be about something. This wasn't one of those. So I had a lot of fun with it. You guys. Uh, I'm writing a play about an egg that falls from the sky. Well, it's fun. I'd like to read it. <laughs> and the, um, I really thanks uh, Frank and thanks Amin and the French uh, Cultural Services Nicole, for having us here. And really thank you to everyone that, that showed up. Uh, without you, we can't do anything. It's all about this shared space. So. Keep on going out to readings and support. Um, what came across to me while we this process, and more and more when I hear Frank, Amin, and the other translators talk about Coltes, is the universality of his work. Uh, I guess what first piqued my interest was uh, his connection to New York City, but more and more it seems we're all looking for some kind of, uh, I don't know further understanding, uh, and that's really what's coming up the most to me. There's specific things about the way he writes um, that, 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 uh, that are exciting uh, and, and that are visceral. Um, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, the most thing that came up for me is the universal subjects that Coltes talks about that I think we could all, we obviously all relate to, that's why we're all in this room together. And that's what I would like to keep on pushing out there and support. And thank you everybody for being here, Jean and thank you so much, Frank, and everybody from the French Embassy. Um, I'm going to be very short. For me, um, I really wanted to honor the 
the language and it's my second language, so I was like, oh my god, how can we do this? Um, but I, I really loved it and it's very poetic but very grounded and also it reminded me a bit of Borges, which is not so grounded, but there's something of the repetitions and that it reminded me of Borges. Um, just to punctuate uh, Jose's thoughts, um, I, uh, yeah, I'm taken by the mystery of the work. I think, I think we, can, we, can, we can try to frame it as one thing or another thing. We can say it's body or not body. I'm not so sure. I mean, I feel like there's plenty of narrative in Colpes' work. I feel, um, obviously, there's a great deal of poetry. Um, I think I hear a little bit of, I mean, I think, you, I think like any sort of truly singular canonical writer, you could compare that there are echoes of other, I mean, to me, there's a little Chekhov in there, there could be a little Beckett, there could be a little, you know, there, there's other sort of inflections to his work. But at the end of the day, he's, 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 he's poetic, but he's also, he's, he's talking about authenticity, he's talking about humanity, and he's very much grounded, he is grounded in a certain way. He's, he's palpable, he's visceral, he's, he's hitting things. And, and I think that there's plenty for, for us to do as actors as well. Uh, in this work, and it, and, it, and it can really, it can have a, there can be a real interactive quality to it. It doesn't have to be out of the sky. I think there's a real earthbound quality to it as well. So maybe uh, since we're a little bit up in time, we open it uh, to those. It looks like the most uh, intelligent audience I've seen in two years. Uh, <laughs> and anyway, it is actually. Uh, so uh, are there a couple of questions or comments? And put up your arm, number one, and someone else. Um, thank you for all of this, and I mean for bringing Cortez to the world. I guess my question has to do with Cortez as a very gay writer, and somehow tonight he came out as straight. And <laughs> if you have some comments, I mean, Dalishan de Cortez, it's it's a it's a a scene of divide, and I guess you know if you had the choice of you know how you chose the you know, the actors tonight, but I mean, I felt like I was watching a straight writer, and I'm certain about it. Thanks, um, this, is, this is one of the major questions of this, and um, uh, I'm not going to take like 30 minutes to answer this, although I should. Um, so, in the book, I address that. In the uh, introduction of the biography, the point. And so, because this, especially you refer to the uh, solitude play, and uh, the solitude play really started becoming famous after the third production that I believe uh, Marion was referring to in 95, right? No, 95. Pacheco and Pascal Gregory. Pascal Gregory. And by that time, because it was dead. And before the second production, Shevo already played it, and uh, it was already, uh, Cortez wasn't happy about it. He wasn't happy because Shevo was trying to pretty much do what you described. It was trying to emphasize the, uh, what he called the homoerotic relationship between the characters. Uh, but for him, it wasn't about a certain kind of sexuality. It was mostly, almost entirely about the notion of desire, which comes in the text almost like impossibly. I don't know how many mention of the word desire is in the text. And that and he addresses that in one of the interviews in which he says um, that he's I'm quoting more or less paraphrasing that my my homosexuality doesn't define is not a strong enough pillar for my writing, but the, but desire is. And the desire the notion of desire uh, for him, runs across um, forms of sexuality, including including um, the Taba Taba, the short play Taba Taba, uh, is somewhat controversial because a certain form of sexual desire, including between siblings. So really, it's not just about for him. It's not just about uh, you know. Although in his life he was very much. Uh, free by the game, especially in New York. In Paris, they were a little bit too late for him because he already had a New York and he lived in New York. 
but it never translated, uh, translated into his work. And uh, the only reason Shero, I believe that Shero himself talked about it, the only reason Shero could do the third production with putting so much emphasis on the eroticism between the two men is because of this book. Because he would not have approved of it. And he didn't say it. He wouldn't approve of it. Um, yeah. We have two more, two more questions. Um, yes. I think this question would lend itself towards the performers to a certain degree. One of the things that I love about Lucas and what comes forward in the readings today is that even when he has two people on stage, or he's writing dialogue, he's actually kind of writing monologues for the second performer to to respond to, so, so there are like three waves of language that are happening. There's his language, there is the second performer's res response to the language, and then there's like a dialogue, and then that goes to the audience. So I'm just very interested, well, I'm grateful to have been able to see that stage tonight. Um, and uh, I guess the question would be for, the directors and the performers, how the time that it takes to actually work with Coltes' language so that you can have that immediacy of response and then get that wave to the audience who will then be the third receptor of, of the scene. I, I, I'm going to be able to respond. I'm just going to you respond when that is an excellent I mean, the amount of time that we have is so short. And the, the work that these people did was so great. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, I I'll try to address it. If I'm not, if not, if we aren't, let us know. Obviously, we're not on track. Uh, in terms of the time, we just tried it out. It's, it's for all of us, as I give as much as we can to everyone here, uh, whatever the amount of time it is. Realistically, behind the scenes, you're lucky if you get it a few hours of rehearsal with this. It's just the nature of the beast and logistics. Uh, we were able to sit down for a couple of hours, but other than that, it, it's showing up the day of, like all my uh, peers here, and just doing the best that we can, trusting each other. That, that's the technical part of it. Um, in terms of the monologues, I don't have anything interesting to say. And not that I've, not that I've said anything interesting uh, earlier. We're just, uh, have the words, and try to communicate action. We had a nice discussion about like uh, emotions and tones that he Cortez tries tries to evoke. Sometimes with the repetition, many things that were repeated that, that were mentioned here. Uh, but for us, we were talking. Yeah, but for us in life, when we talk, even now, there's psychology going on, but we're not aware of it. Probably it comes out in our behavior and what we're doing because we want something. Like now, I want to try to give you the best answer I can. Um, so that's as interesting as it gets, I think, for, for us. We don't look, yeah, that's good. Maybe one, one last question. Do you want to have a reception I, afterwards? We can talk Fred, about just one oh, yes, now you're. Okay. Uh, there's also a character in West Pier that doesn't speak throughout the entire play. And it doesn't mean like, you know, so that's another language. So that's an acting language. How do you fill out your two hours of non speaking and present in every scene? And the other thing I can tell you is that we saw you in the film Shai Directed. We worked on conjunction. Uh, it's long monologues and and because, because, and because if, if, if this is how we worked the choreography and the tempo was just uh, through these words. And that was a very hard and long uh, work. I'll, I'll just jump in really quickly to share um, a, a famous quote from an interview that Coltes did, where the, the interviewer asked him to, to talk about solitude and, as a dialogue. He said, it's not a dialogue, it's a monologue. Can I say one little thing? Um, so for me, there were two things that I mean the mention was the repetition and rhythm. But also you mentioned something about this attachment, right? Or, or like, in, the, in terms of the acting that Coltes used to, and that also stayed in my mind. 
Yes, uh, there's this famous quote uh, at the end of West Pier when he says that actors should play the text as a little boy who's in front of his classroom and he needs to pee. And, and that he just tells his text thinking that, oh, I have to go, I have to go, I have to go. And then suddenly he runs off to the bathroom. So he knows that all is there. Last question. So I guess as far as the book, how does it relate to other books of his work? And like, how complete is it? Right, that's a, that's a very important question. Uh, these are the seven, what he himself calls the corpus, his quote unquote real corpus, right? So after he passed away, there were uh, a number of other previous texts that came out that were very value, valuable. They're not included in the these, these texts, the ones that are here, are the seven plays that he himself basically describes as the is major dramatic works. Now, um, uh, hopefully there is going to, there needs to be more of what is coming out. Uh, the interviews are amazing. The letters are amazing. Uh, the previous plays, some of them are absolutely fantastic. Uh, now, uh, again, this book, as I tried to mention, tried to, to, to present a different approach to translation at the same time, I tried to provide a lot of material that wasn't available to the English speakers. Uh, and I really hope that it really starts a certain form of not just scholarship, new scholarship, but for new productions. So thank you all. Thanks to the actors. Thanks to Ami, the translators. You guys are so many talks. Thank you all. <laughs> All the translators can sign. We have a little table. I want you to go over there. And there is a reception, the French cultural service will be allowed to be graciously and uh, a reception. And also, have a look at the bookstore. Thank you all for coming.